Fantastic. So I have a handheld mic, so I feel like a stand-up comedian this afternoon. It's great. So <coughs> welcome. Um, we are going to be talking about scaling without a religious methodology. So just to set the scene a little bit, um, this uh, if you end up watching this on video, this is the slot after lunch. It's known as the graveyard slot. Mm -hmm. So this is where, so if you're watching at home, in order to get the full experience, what you need to do is eat a really big meal and then sit in a dark room and then start watching. Yeah. Okay, and then so I'll speak quietly because then you can sleep. Okay, I don't want to <laughs> disturb anyone. Um, just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about here. Uh, I'm Dan North. I've been involved in software for about 25 years. Uh, um, I've been involved in helping organizations be the right shape to deliver software for about 10 of those. Uh, um, Catherine has been messing with the minds of typically fairly senior people in organizations for a whole bunch of time. And again, helping them. What Catherine's gift is, I think, um, is she helps people see what's really there. And it turns out it's really hard to help people see what's really there, <laughs> mostly because it's hiding in plain sight and also because people are really reluctant to actually see what's really there. So um, that's who we are. Um, <clears throat> uh, so in terms, of, uh, in terms of what we're going to talk about then. So I want to talk about, uh, well, I, I wanted to talk about initially uh, how I've been helping organizations deliver at scale um, and why I've kind of gotten past uh, or never really been that enamored with a lot of these big scaling agile methods uh, um, and, and these sort of big structured things. And so I got talking to Catherine about this and she said, oh yeah, I can explain why. And I was like, what do you mean? So I started talking to her and she said, well, because there's this and this and this. And I went, oh my goodness, you know, poof, hiding in plain sight. So, so we figured that what we're going to do is I'm going to describe how I engage with clients or how clients engage with me and sort of a bit of the story arc there and how we kind of talk to each other. Then Catherine's going to do the science bit in the middle, right, or the, <laughs> the religion bit in the middle, the bit that explains why all this stuff happens. And then I want to talk a little bit about, um, therefore, what I've been doing with some organizations uh, on the back of this and, and why, so, so, so some things that might work. Uh, um, and then we're going to try and tidy it all up neatly at the end. So that's, that's yes. roughly where we're going. That's going to okay. be a challenge there. That's so. our challenge defined. Um, and I guess the, the target audience or the, you know, we're kind of speaking to today is that you've probably tried lean agile techniques and you've had some success or, you know, varied success. Uh, you're thinking about rolling it out further. Sounds like a good idea. Maybe you're look, having some difficulty with it. Maybe you're in hell. Who knows? Uh, and you're also looking at enterprise solutions. So that's where we're at. But I'm going to let you kick it off from here then. Cool, fantastic, thank you. So, <clears throat> so what happens, the way I usually engage is someone contacts me. It's like an inbound email or something, and they go, please help us. And they go, okay, that sounds like fun. I'll see if I can help you. And sometimes the people who say, please help us, are business stakeholders. And they say, dear Dan, they say, um, IT is really slow to deliver. I go, okay, oh, that sounds familiar. They say, IT is expensive and it's poor value. And we've gotten so disillusioned with them that we've spun up our own little guerrilla IT teams and that's working out really well. Oh, no, that's not working. What are we going to do? And they say things like, we get too many surprises. We get surprises in production. We get things blowing up. Um, we get surprises uh, in terms of things changing. We get surprises in terms of eye-watering ongoing maintenance costs and all this. All this kind of, it's, just, it's just what we want is fewer surprises. And then we've got this PMO, this kind of program management office that are supposed to be looking at you know, governance and oversight and all that. And they usually give us really rubbish information too late. What can we do? Okay, that's one kind of email I get. Another kind of email I get is from development teams. And they go, <coughs> we know we're slow. Dear Dan, we know we're slow, um, but we're working really hard. We're trying really hard. And it seems that the harder we work, the slower we go. What's that about? And then they say, business doesn't trust us, you know. Which is a shame because they're really nice people and we share a canteen with them. Um, and the PMO micromanages us and they come and come tell us what to do and they give us all these forms to fill out. And then infrastructure is a bottleneck. You know, just trying to get a server around here is unbelievably hard. And our landscape is so complicated and it's not getting any less complicated. I worked for one bank, American bank, and the way that was the biggest bank. And it hadn't occurred to me there was a biggest bank, but these guys were the biggest bank. And the way you become the biggest bank is you bang lots of little banks together. Okay? And when you bang lots of little banks together, you get lots and lots of uh, legacy systems that all kind of bang together as well, and they don't really play very nice. And so then, have we lost the screens? Hello, AV people. Can we have the telly back? 
Is that the cable? Let me try, fiddling. I didn't do anything. Let me try switching it off and on again. Wait a minute. Everyone always blames the Australian, and I promise you, I didn't do a thing. Standing here quite a bit. Let me plug this back in again. We had this earlier on, actually, with Dave Farley's. Uh, 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 uh. What's going to happen? Oh, that's looking good. Yay! Hey. TV's back. Reboot. Fantastic. Oh, no, there's nothing on. Look at this. Okay. So, so that's, what, that's what I get from the IT folks. Now, sometimes I hear from PMO and change groups, and they say things like, Dear Dan, IT always blow their estimates, and they can't stick to a plan, uh, and we can't trust them, and, and they're really dodgy. And they say, how can we govern and how can we report, which is our kind of role. Our role is governance and reporting and making sure everything's lined up. And they say, do you know what, actually... Often we don't even know what's going on. We, it's the, the, we don't know what, if their work's aligned with the organisation. We don't know if what they're doing is what they're supposed to be doing. They just do stuff. And we ask them what they're doing and say, we're doing stuff. And then the last group I sometimes hear from is infrastructure themselves. And they go, look, we want to help, but the dev teams won't tell us what they need. And uh, I say, what do you mean? And they say, well, basically we work on an annual procurement cycle. right? So that means we need to know stuff in advance. And we're just trying to help them. And we go, oh, oh, okay. Uh, um, and so, please help us. And so, so they say, what are we doing so wrong? And, and I basically, I have a, a stock answer that I give them. And it's a fairly short stock answer. And it's usually done with kind of post-its and a little workshop and, and a coin game. If anyone's ever played the penny game for sort of showing flow and that kind of stuff. And I say this. I say, you're aiming at the wrong target. Right? You've got really, really good at aiming at the wrong target. And they say, what do you mean? And I say, well, there's this thing called cost accounting. Started in like the 1950s, or became popular in the 1950s in the West. One of my favourite recent statistics: something like 84% of Western organisations, so European and American organisations, are ba uh, base their finance and governance decisions on cost accounting principles. In Japan, it's 14%. Okay, so about six out of every seven Japanese companies went. That's a stupid thing to do. Probably don't want to do that. So how does cost accounting work? Cost accounting works in terms of organizational structure. It says you have the organizations in these divisions, and these divisions are profit centers or cost centers. So if you're the sales team, that's a profit center. So we want to maximize profit there. So we have things like commissions and incentive schemes. If you're pretty much anywhere else, right? Engineering, manufacturing, distribution, logistics, uh, uh, marketing, um, HR, finance, all of those, you're a cost center. And so what we need is for you to cost less. Because if the profit center makes more money and the cost centers cost less money, woohoo, cha-ching, right? And so how do they work? They work on local performance targets. So each part of the organization is trying to ratchet down or ratchet up its thing, OK? Um, and so, and so what, how do we measure this? We measure this based on busyness, like timesheets. And who has timesheets and cost codes and project codes? And <laughs> yeah, oh, oh. If someone next to you just put their hand up, Give them a hug. <laughs> if, they are con if that's a consent, if they check first, check safety first. If they're the kind of person who responds to hugging, they could probably use one right now. Okay. And they say, but damn, what are the alternatives? And I say, well, there's this thing called throughput accounting. Uh, this chap, Ellie Goldratt, proposed it in, a, in his book, The Goal, 1984. Uh, um, fantastic uh, adventure story for people who run factories. And throughput accounting, all of the equivalent things are just a bit different. So we don't think of cost centers and profit centers. We think of the whole organization as a holistic thing that's creating value. And they go, oh, right. So the fact that the salesperson takes the money is no more interesting than the fact that smoke comes out the tailpipe of the car. The smoke isn't created in the tailpipe of the car. That's just where you first observe it. Okay? Likewise, the money, the value isn't created at the point of sale. The value is created elsewhere in the organization by us lot and by a bunch of other people like us lot. So, so what, what, do we, what do we go after then, rather than local performance targets? Because we know local optimizations don't work. So we go after identifying and resolving bottlenecks. So we're looking at how value flows through the organization, and we look at where value gets stuck, and we go after that. Okay? So what do we measure? We measure things like lead time and throughput. So lead time is wall clock time. How long from I have a need to thank you does it take? Because if I can shorten the amount of time it takes from I have a need to thank you, I'm better value than people who can't. And throughput is how much stuff is getting done that is giving us value. Okay? So we get feedback from that. And uh, Ina was talking this morning, <coughs> if you were in her, her talk uh, just after Joe's, 
and she was saying that like, if your process can't respond to feedback, it doesn't matter how good the quality of feedback you get is. And they go, oh, right. Thanks, Dan. That's brilliant. That was a really useful couple of days. Thank you. Here's some money. And I go, thank you very much. It's consulting. It's awesome. Um, and they go, right, Agile is going to save us. And I go, oh, crap. <laughs> right? Because big A Agile TM is going to save us. Okay? And what I get when I hear this, well, the first thing I get is, I'll speak to you in a bit. Because <laughs> that's not my bag. That's some other people. Go talk to some other people. Um, I'll wait. Um, is, is this. Who's seen the play Waiting for Godot? It's joyful. It's joyful. Tom Stoppard, 1950s. So the whole play, this is a, a still from a New York production a few years ago. The whole play is basically these two guys waiting. Okay? It's called a tragicomedy. So you've got these two chaps, <coughs> uh, Vladimir and Estragon, and they're waiting for Godot. And the whole arc of the play, you learn all these things about Godot and how things will be better when Godot comes. Okay? And things will be better. And, and, we're, and we're waiting for Godot and eventually, spoiler, Godot doesn't come. Oh, no. Go and see it anyway. It's brilliant. Okay? <laughs> but they're basically, they're waiting and waiting. And the whole play is about how everything's going to be better when Godot arrives. And I just think, yeah, right. So then, um, then I get an email. <laughs> Dear Dan, <laughs> we tried Big A Agile method, blah, TM, didn't save us. And I get different kinds of emails. I got from the business guys or whatever it is those IT folks were doing. Right? So it was some IT-only initiative and they were agiling for a couple of years. And I don't know, we spent a bunch of money on it. Um, yeah. It's basically gotten more expensive, slower. One of the things I heard was, so in the old days, before we had Agile TM, I could just go and tap my favorite developer on the shoulder and ask them for something, and I'll get it the next day. Now I have to put it on a backlog into swim lanes with a release train and a, and a deployment truck or some other. I don't know. I don't know what the things are. But basically, it now takes six months to get something I used to get in a day. I'm going, oh, right, that's agile. Yeah, yeah, we hate it. Um, development goes, it's the same old command and control, just with different labels on. Right? My, my project manager went on a two-day residential class and came back as a scrum master, mm -hmm. which is like a project manager, but with a badge. Right? <laughs> and my business analysts are no longer business analysts. They came back as product owners on a different class, apart from the other ones that came back as data scientists. Because right? oh. that's what we call business analysts now. Um, same old command control, just different labels. Okay? Um, PMO, Agile didn't save us. People were even more reluctant to give estimates. <laughs> Where's Woody? <laughs> <laughs> they even have a hashtag. Oh. 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 Oh, Are we going to do again. our special thing? Hang on. I'm just going to try switching it off and on again. If only people were so easy. I know, right? This may or may not work. Let's go with not work. Okay. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. One potato, two potato, three, three. potato. <laughs> One, talk amongst yourselves. Two, talk amongst yourselves. Three, talk amongst yourselves. Oops, no. Let's try that. We definitely know it's the cable here, but we just don't know why it's the cable here. We need to what? We need to rewire, but we can't do it now. That's, that sounds like some, some of the emails I get as well. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so I will carry on. Pretend there's slides. <coughs> so then the other email I get is from infrastructure. And they say, Agile didn't save us. Now they're even less likely to know what they want because they keep changing their mind. Okay? And, and that kind of sucks. Wait a minute. I'm going to try and get this working. <coughs> Come on. It's okay. I, I can do mine without sign. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. You're awesome. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say, you know. <laughs> it's, yeah, exactly. Got Godot's on the AV today. So, yeah, that's handy. So, <coughs> so what they're really all saying is this. They're all saying... That thing we tried worked okay for a little bit, uh, and then it stopped working. Okay? So we've got someone in the crew shirts wandering around at the back. And, and so and that becomes the common theme that I hear from all of these different stakeholder groups is we tried this thing. We went out and bought ourselves a few kilos of safe or a couple of pounds of uh, um, less or you know, a truckload of dad or whatever it was. Um, all these agile things, basically what the, the way to make a load of money it turns out, is to put an adjective in front of the word agile. So you've got disciplined, you've got scaled, you've got 
Uh, I, I, was at a, I was at a talk recently, and this guy was co completely straight face. He's working for an, aer an aeronautics company. And the CEO there, they have a scrum of, scrum of, scrum of scrums. Yes, I've seen it. Okay, scrum of, scrum of, four. four. I was like, come on, this is like, uh, what, what's, what's that movie where time slows down inside the various different levels of, yeah, that inception, right? So you have a scrum, and then the people from there, one person goes to the scrum of scrums, one person from those goes to the... So this person at the CEO is going, oh, I've never had better, I've never had better information, scrum of scrums, scrum of scrums works. I'm like, by definition, everything you're hearing is four levels removed from the action. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> and what I'm hearing in between is that we've got it down to four, right? That's why he was so excited about. <clears throat> but so please help us. That thing we tried worked okay, and then it stopped working. So how do we always end up here? How do we always end up with that thing we tried worked okay and then it stopped working? And I was talking to Catherine about this over, over green tea, which is Catherine's staple diet, and she said, mate, country. I might be able to help you with that. Well, do we wait for the slides or do I speak? Well, we'll let the slides catch up. Uh, so when we're rolling out these methods and techniques, we get to that point where, so, where suddenly it's not working, we're not really sure why. Are we okay for me to keep talking while we have the distraction of setup? Yep, okay. And so we end up in this position where we start to believe one of two things. Perhaps we should be doing this method even... Oh, it's a miracle. <laughs> I'm disorientated. Um, perhaps we, we um, should be doing these methods even more perfectly, right? So the reason it's not going well is because we need to perfect the method. And the other thing that we, need, we sometimes think is the reason it's not going well is because we actually need to do far more of the method, right? Even more of these techniques. And to some degree, that could be true. But there are other things at play that I find an awareness of gives you an advantage, right, of what you can do next. So this is what I get called in to look at. We've tried Lean Agile, it doesn't work, or it hasn't worked, or we've got difficulty with it. We've tried an enterprise solution, perhaps, and it started to go wrong. And now we don't know what we need to do, right? Because the more we try to perfect it and the more we try to do more, it still seems not quite right at the very least. So I became, I'm the kind of person who's very skeptical, so I just need to know why. So I spent around about 10 years looking at reasons as to why this might be the way it is. But because I'm strange, as Aino mentioned, I didn't look in the right kind of places I looked in things like Eastern philosophy. So I noticed a pattern over time, and I wondered whether there were models in Eastern philosophy that could illuminate what was going on. And so there's two simple concepts that I wanted to get across to you, and I use these to trigger leadership to be able to change or to be able to help delivery on a, a large scale to a small scale. So these are almost fractal in nature. And this first concept that I'm going to show you is developed by Buddhist monks and nuns two and a half thousand years ago, right? And uh, they noticed some, they were very interested in what causes suffering and difficulty because they wanted to get rid of it. So one of the first things they did was observe how the world works around them. That was their thing. So they're observing away and they notice a few patterns that they think, oh, we should keep that in mind if we want to reduce difficulty. So they recorded it. Uh, in the sense of to memory, and they chanted it for two and a half thousand years until we could you know, have the written form, and it arrives in the modern day. So this is the first one. This is the three characteristics of existence, which I think are the three characteristics of context in general. So the first element is change. They saw that everything in the universe is in a state of constant change. So, for instance, when that relates to us in business, we try to make a plan. And when we apply that plan, hardly any of it, any of it goes to plan, right? Now, that happens over and over and over again, sometimes at different speeds. That's okay. Now, science, two and a half thousand years ago, caught up to the monks and the nuns. And it went, oh, yes, we have this concept called the arrow of time in physics and entropy. And if you watch the BBC uh, docuseries from Professor Cox, he'll explain the whole damn thing in detail. And I think it's like six, six episodes, if you, if you don't believe me. So the next element is interdependency. 
that everything is in a constant state of interdependency. So in actual fact, we try to work in isolation because some of us are introverts like me and we like it. But we are always in some form of a system. And we always end up having to work with other elements. No single system is isolated now. Complexity from globalization, security, etc., etc., is making things much more interdependent. And science, two and a half thousand years ago, kind of caught up with that idea because we've all discovered recently that we have space particles in our bodies, don't we? Right? So we are interdependent with, to the universe at a very molecular level. So we get the impression sometimes that we are alone and that it's all about me. But in actual fact, we're in an interdependent system and that leads to this idea of systems thinking. That's where that all comes from. So the next element of the model is dissatisfaction. So you're in an environment where it's constantly changing, so you don't really have control for very long, you can't get perfection for very long, and it's all interdependent, so it's messy and complex. And in that environment you have dissatisfaction about it. Right? It's damn annoying. So human beings are in a constant state of a little bit of dis dissatisfaction. For a while we're thrilled and then something happens and messes it up. It's very hard to stay in a control position, and so, when we can't make things perfect, what do we do? Well, before we have a tantrum and sulk at this point, right, and say, well, what's the point? So, I put in a system, I put in this and that, and it's going to change. It's going to be interdependent, so it's going to become complex. It's going to be damn un dissatisfying. So what? Great, let's just not do anything then, right? I hear the sulk. Well, there's something interesting that can happen when you see this model and you work with the model. It's very, very simple. That's what the monks... And, well, to memorise these models, they reduced everything down because it was ver verbal, the way they handed them down. So, change drives the need to adapt, right? So, just adapt to the change. If a new competitor has a new feature, we don't need to get all upset about it and kill the competitor. We can adapt our product to compete or make a better one. If we have interdependency, we can see that that drives collaboration. We can embrace interdependency and collaborate together. For the final one, dissatisfaction, we can take dissatisfaction as feedback for learning so that we iterate. So these are almost like the parent models for lean and agile, right? You've got adapt, collaborate and iterate. So in light of that, there are methods that recognise this intrinsically and they arise. They help us to do this thing, right? Adapt, collaborate, iterate. And they're called Scrum or Kanban or Safe or Dad or Less or whatever there is that you've taken on. And they arose not because there's some big genius somewhere who's like God and goes, you know, I can look beyond everything and find a method that works forever. No, a bunch of guys get together. They go, well, the context we're in isn't working. Let's adapt to that. Let's try something else. That works. Let's use it again and again and again. Still works. Fantastic. Let's package it, share it or sell it. And we go, thank you. That's going to help. Fantastic. And so now we're using all the methods. So knowing this, why does it matter? So I said to Catherine, that's great, so what? There you go. <laughs> that's the conversation. How, how do I use this? How do you use this? So what is happening here is, yeah, so the question is, what's happening that these elements are going wrong? And we have to come back to this idea of, uh, is it because we're not doing them perfectly? Uh, or is it because we should be doing more of them? Well, there's one other way you can look at it. And again, I'm reverting back to what the Buddhist, and, uh, Buddhist monks and nuns talked about, because they thought about this too, and they were pretty curious as to why this might happen. Not about technology, obviously, because that wasn't invented back then. So we have the three inevitables of the universe. Echo, echo, echo. I like to go way, you know... High concept. So this can be applied as the three inevitables of industry in my little mind. So the first one is degradation. As soon as something arises, it is in a state 
of degradation. Science talks about that in terms of entropy and, and the arrow of time. As soon as, as soon as a child is born, it's in a process of life, and that is a form of degradation, in a sense, right? And as soon as a project comes into existence, it's subject to degradation to a degree over time. No project lasts forever, unless you're going to tell me there is one, which there may be in the government somewhere, yeah? <laughs> okay, and so the next inevitable in industry is dysfunction. That it, it's inevitable that any system is going to become dysfunctional at some point. So in, you could think about the body, and you could think about illness. There will be times where you get sick, and then there'll be times where it gets better. That's just the way it is. And the last one is expiry. That everything in existence is subject to expiry. So we live and we die. Projects rise up, they fall away. Teams come together, they fall away. These are three very simple concepts. But before we sulk again, because now all we're finding out is that we're just in a state of degradation, dysfunction, and expiry. What's the point? Yeah, I hear you say. There's another part to this, as there was the other. And that is that degradation is what stimulates us to transform, to maintain, and to refine. And it is dysfunction that stimulates us to innovate, challenges us, like... When we make a mistake in music, we could then go off in some sort of jazz break of some kind and find something new. And when there is expiry, this stimulates creation, starting over, new beginnings, new products. Nokia versus Apple in you know, 2007, that kind of thing. And this is actually what drives pro progress. It makes all the fun stuff that we like in tech, right? It applies to people, projects, teams, strategies, and organizations. So we're addicted to the transforming, the innovating, and the beginning of things. But they don't come unless there is degradation, dysfunction, and expiry. It's a cycle. That's all, nothing major. So, how does that affect this idea of packaged solutions that we've been talking about? Well, this means that any solution that comes into existence, like Scrum, Kanban, BDD, sorry, Dan, um, will, will degrade, will dysfunction, and will expire its usefulness at some point. Except BDD. Right? Pardon? <laughs> except, oh, except BDD. Uh, it's just the way of things. And if you think about it, consider this, that the Kanban that arose in 2009 that I knew is not the same Kanban as it is now. It's been modified. The, the scrum of the early thousands is not the scrum we know now. That's been modified. It's evolved, right? And all of these prepackaged enterprise solutions, funnily enough, have versions because they're evolving. So they have the same title, but they're evolving over time because they're also subject to degradation, dysfunction, and expiry. It's okay, it's just the nature of things. There's nobody's ego getting bruised here, right? So it's interesting that the methods we use to help us prevent degradation, dysfunction, and expiry then become subject to degradation, dysfunction, and expiry. You see, nobody gets out of that prison. We're all in it. We're going in that cycle. So that leads me to what I said to to Dan, which is packaged methods don't last, and I mean that in the sense of some may last longer than others, but eventually they will expire. They can't last. They're not omnipresent things. They're subject to the same laws of the universe that we are. And I went, oh, that makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> um, and it also kind of started explaining some of the things I've been doing. So I'm thinking, what are our options? What kind of things can we do? Um, and before I talk about religious methods, I want to talk about religion, okay, very briefly. Uh, we're running out of time as well, so I'm going to speed up. Uh, um, and so I was trying to find a definition of religion that kind of jive with the way I see religion, and I couldn't find one on the intertube, so I wrote this. Uh, it's the structures, constraints, and rituals we humans accrete around some kernel of faith because we crave answers and we fear uncertainty. Uh, um, I, could un I could spend an hour unpacking that. I've given a talk about that before. Uh, um, 
So I became a Christian in my 30s, which is like a really dumb time in your life to become a Christian and really untrendy, it turns out. So there's that. Uh, um, and I, I did it by arguing my way into it. So in other words, I did it with an evidence-based faith. There's loads of different kinds of faith. There's blind faith. There's evidence-based faith. There's all kinds of things in the middle. Science is faith. Okay? But science is, that, like Popper's scientific method is saying, look, we, we're choosing to believe in these things. We're choosing to believe in them because we can't prove them. The scientific method says you cannot prove anything. You can just successively fail to disprove it. And the more ingeniously we fail to disprove it, the more reason we have to have faith in this thing. That's what I mean by faith. And then religion is all the cruft that we wrap around it. So things like, um, and, and this is typically uh, in Judaism, they have the Talmud. So you've got the Torah, which is these first five books of the Bible. Um, and then the Talmud is all of the interpretations of those. So the Torah says, don't work on the Sabbath. Relax on the Sabbath. And like, oh, that sounds like a nice thing to do. Thanks, God. So no, I, I took the Sabbath off. You should take the Sabbath off. And then they go, what does is, what is not working mean? Or is walking working? Uh, depends how many steps you take. What? Yeah, right. We'll say 600. 600 is too many steps. Okay, great. So now I need to count how many steps I take on the Sabbath to make sure I don't do 600. Surely that's work. I don't know. But <clears throat> uh, and, and so on. So Christianity has these things called uh, mysteries. And the point is you can't know them. They're unknowable. And that wasn't good enough for the early church. So they went, I know it's unknowable, but what's the answer? And so one part of the church said, this is the answer. Another part said, this is the answer. And because, guess what, it's unknowable, they started beating each other up. And that's like several centuries of Christianity right there. So <clears throat> then, scaling without a religious methodology, what does that mean? There's a bunch of things we need, and there's a bunch of things we do. So I'm going to very briefly talk about the things we need and the things we do. And the reason I'm going to talk about them briefly is any one of these we could unpack into a massive conversation. So what I really want to do here, and what Catherine and I want to do with this talk, is just to get some awareness and just to get some conversations going. So table stakes. These are necessary but not sufficient. These are the things you're going to need. You're going to need education. You're going to need to learn stuff. This is where some of those structured methods actually can help. You know, uh, Don Reinertsen's uh, product development flow at work is, I mean, it's genius. It's, it's mind-bogglingly brilliant. And it's really, really hard to get your, wrap your head around. So SAFE is kind of like a Janet and John introduction to how flow works. Okay? Um, and so you can go and learn that, and then you can go and learn the real stuff from Don, and then you go, oh, right, I see. But you're going to need education. You're going to need to go and learn that these other methods exist. Um, and then you're going to need to practice, because education, learning without practice is, is futile. Okay? And because you're going to need to practice, you're going to need to mess up and fix it and all that, which means you're going to need time. So when I go into an organization of any size, if you're not prepared to put you know, three to five years skin in the game, there probably isn't any point starting because it will just be investment and no real return. And they say, mm, okay, so you know, now have I got your attention kind of thing. And I say, therefore, you're going to need to put your hands in your pocket. Okay, and they go, hmm. Okay, and, and again, these are difficult conversations, but if we don't have these difficult conversations, then really we're, gonna, we're on a hiding to nowhere. And then once we've got investment, then we look at things like influence. There's no point the people doing this will fail unless they have access to the kinds of people that can change policy, change structure, change rules in the organization. So influence might mean access, influence might mean privilege, it might mean a lovely phrase I came across from a, a chap called Anwan Simmons a couple of years ago, lending privilege. So it might mean someone in a position of privilege lends me access to the tables they can sit at. Okay. Communications. We are going to have a whole bunch of different stakeholders with a whole bunch of different needs and a whole bunch of different messages, and we need to have a common strategy from the get-go. If we don't, it doesn't matter how well we're doing, there's an inverse power law of how much people believe us in terms of physical distance from us. Okay. People right involved in the work really get it. As soon as they're the other side of a door, they don't. We're going to need external help. Okay, you can try and do it on your own. Good luck. When it breaks, come and talk to me. Right? So, or other people as well. Um, you're going to need some help. And finally, you're going to need leadership. And leadership, I'm just going to unpack very briefly. And again, we could just talk all day about leadership. There's three elements I think are really important to this kind of leadership. The first is consistent. So in other words, as I said, this is a three to five year play. If you rotate CIO every 18 months, don't bother with this. Okay? Uh, I worked with one client, and they used CTO as a unit of time. So, oh, yeah, that was about four CTOs ago. I was like, <laughs> and it was the CTO who'd engaged me, and I kind of mentioned this to him, and he went, ah, useful, good to know. He's now the CEO, which means he only lasted 18 months as a CTO. But, 
<laughs> um, so consistent. <clears throat> the second thing I need is invested, right? This isn't a side project. This is the thing we're doing. This is the corporate strategy. This is what we're going to become. And if you don't take it that seriously, again, it won't work. And the third thing is it needs to be resilient. And resilient means leadership isn't two or three charismatic people at the top of the organization. Uh, resilient is your leader, leader model all the way up and down the organization. Everyone is empowered, all of that stuff. Um, it's based on really simple principles. That's why it's really hard to sell methodology, I think, because the core of it is really simple. The core of it is people are basically good. We're going to choose to believe that people are basically good, which is an Ellie Goldratt quote, um, and then everyone is trying to help, Virginia Satir, right? So let's assume positive intent, and therefore, if you're seeing pathological behavior, it's because we built a system of work that presents as pathological behavior. We should probably try building a different system. Sustainable flow of value, that's what we care about. What does value mean? What does flow mean? What does sustainable mean? Again, we could talk all day about that. That's the goal, okay? The goal is, can we identify where we create value? Can we identify where that is getting stuck in the organization? Can we unstick that? So that means we're going to need to learn some new tricks. We need to learn some new metrics. We're going to need to learn, learn, some, new, learn some new techniques. And then the third thing, theory of constraints. You can only unpick one constraint. If you have a pipe with some value going through it, there is one point at which it's most constrained. You cannot know where else it's constrained until you undo that bit. And then that exposes the next bit, and that exposes the next bit, so it's whack-a-mole with constraints, okay? Uh, I recommend this to everyone. This is one particular piece of concrete advice. Get the goal, give it to all of your, whoever's involved in any change initiative anywhere, and all of you read it as a book club. <laughs> read a couple of chapters, spend a couple of weeks applying it, read a couple of chapters, come back and report what you learned. It's a really fun read. Um, and, and you'll get a lot out of it, okay? Um, so this is literally, this is literally all of it. Okay, not quite literally, but nearly literally all of it is this, is we work in small cycles of visualize, stabilize, optimize. Visualize means turn, turn the lights on. Uh, again, a bunch of Catherine's really good work around kind of seeing what's really there, seeing what's hiding in plain sight. So simple things like value stream mapping. Map where the work is, map where the queues are, map where the blockers are, map where work leaves a team and is dependent on other teams, map where uh, um, interdependencies are in the organization and embrace those interdependencies rather than trying to pretend they're not there. Once you've visualized it, stabilize it. So even if it's, if it doesn't matter if things are eye-wateringly bad as long as they're consistently eye-wateringly bad. Because <laughs> once we've got stability, now we can start twiddling with the dials. Otherwise, you twiddle with dials, you've got no idea what impact you had. And finally, you get to optimize. And the problem is we're a room full of engineers, and so we all want to do that third one. We all want to go, optimize, woohoo! Um, don't start there, right, because you're just twiddling di dials in the dark. Start small, get data, okay? You'll hear this, I hopefully, you'll hear this all day from all kinds of different people. Start somewhere small, get data, measure, okay? And based on that data, learn from mistakes. Yep. Iterate. Okay? Mistakes are opportunities for learning. Okay? That is literally all of it. This is what I do with organization after organization is I teach them how to do this and then I step away and they're kind of doing it. And it's really exciting because the, it's one of those things where the better you get at it, the better you get at it. It becomes it's a little bit addictive. Okay? Um, and hopefully that's most of what we wanted to say, I think. Yes, well, I think it is. Oh, right. I get to sum up. And ah, you get the clicker. All right, so the whole idea is not to be fooled um, by thinking that there is the answer, right? Because the answer is actually that there is no answer, right? Instead, think about, um, start with the method, if, because that's a good starting point, but expect degradation, dysfunction, and expiry, and use that to transform, innovate, and create new beginnings, which is basically what you were saying earlier, and adapt and collaborate and iterate. You can't defeat the universe, you'll become exhausted if you try. So it's fair enough to do these things, but understand that there is a limit. You'll fatigue yourself otherwise. And it's understanding how to work with these things rather than fight these things. So this is a quote. I was talking to Catherine about this, and she came out with these words, and I said, I am going to write this down verbatim and tell people because I think it's a really, really powerful way of kind of wrapping it all up. But mastery is understanding how to work with the grain, right? So with degradation, with dissatisfaction, embrace those things, with change. So adapting, iterating, combining techniques, piping techniques together, right? There's a Unix pipes again, yeah? 
Um, but it has to be for your context and the changes around you, which is why there's no magic formula. Um, okay? And wonderfully, this is the second time today, at least I've heard it, to reiterate Ino's point from earlier on, there is hope. Yeah. Right? There is hope, because we can understand how the universe works, we just can't beat it. Yeah. That's okay. I don't mind those odds. <laughs> Instead of looking at the left, which was your, your, your depressing stuff in the red, which was change, interdependency, and dissatisfaction, you look for the things on the right, because that's the cycle. Yeah. And so all this is going to take a bunch of those things, a bunch of those table states. It's going to take education. It's going to take time. It's going to take practice. It's going to take leadership. Um, it's going to take a bunch of other things. So yeah. that's kind of, I think, what we wanted to say, wasn't it? Yeah, you can't cheat it. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.